Um, I'm really glad that you guys are here. Um, this, I've been looking forward to this for a long while. Um, and you are probably here because you want help in navigating relational conflict, knowing how to reconcile, knowing how to forgive. Uh, and Patrick is well equipped uh, to teach us all this. So he's gonna introduce himself, but uh, just so you know, he is the, if you don't know, he's the father of our youth pastor, and he's so much more than that, uh, but we have a special family relationship to him, and I'm glad he can be here. I'm gonna pray for our time together. Uh, one more thing before I pray, just so I, I don't forget, there are microphones, there'll be a mic there and a mic there as well. If you have questions, Patrick will stop at various points, just grab one of those mics and, and ask your questions so all of us can hear, and then we are gonna be recording it as well, so ask a really super embarrassing question that'll be saved on the internet forever, um, and it'll be great. Now let's pray for the Lord's help for this time. Father, every day that we have is in your hands. Every relationship that we have is in your hands. All of our lives, we rely on you, and you made us to live in unity and love, but in this fallen world, things break down so easily and in so many ways. And in this room, I know that there are testimony after testimony of all the ways that we are hurt and that we hurt others. But Jesus, you came to restore and forgive and to reconcile and to teach your people how to do the same. So I pray, Spirit, that you would be with us in this time. Give us good listening ears and open and soft hearts. We pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. Let's all give a round of applause for Patrick. Good morning. Hey, there we go. <laughs> we'll try to be somewhat interactive today, um, which will be a little more interesting for you and for me as well. Um, but I don't want to do a six-hour lecture. I want us to be able to talk about this together as we go through some learning together and experience um, all of this and experience what God would have for us to learn with one another. You uh, should have gotten a guide on your way in. We'll be re uh, walking through this largely today. Um, participant's guide. And then also a brochure. Hang on to that. And uh, that'll be useful for you, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So uh, I'm really glad to be here. Thanks, Mike. We've been working for a while to get our time set up to be here, and, uh, and that's okay. It's actually super fun to be able to come here and have this conversation in a, a healthy church. Because as you can imagine, I have this conversation in churches that are, that are not in the place that you're in. Uh, this is also something that we do to help churches when they are stuck, deeply mired in conflict, and, and, and I'm, I actually mean stuck. They can't get out, they can't move forward, they can't turn left or right, and they need that kind of help. And so to be able to come, I, and I really enjoy coming to a church that's like, hey, we just want to learn. It's like, cool, let's do that together. That sounds great so that we can avoid getting stuck so much. Um, I want to give you a little bit of background about me, and uh, like Mike said, this can be interactive, so if you have questions, that's great too. Um, I grew up in Ohio and met my wife right after high school graduation, uh, which was really fun. And so we met, went to Cedarville University, and then uh, really got engaged when we were married. We got so engaged in our church. Some of you might be able to relate to this. Like, we loved it. We were married with no kids, and we were doing, we were on the missions team. We were serving in the nursery. We were doing middle school. Like, you know you got, you know, your young, overly zealous couple when you can say, would you guys take over middle school? So we were even doing that. We were doing all kinds of stuff. And we just thought, you know what, we love this so much. God's been nudging us for a long time. Let's just take the plunge and serve the Lord in, in his church. So uh, that led us to Trinity in Chicago for um, Master of Divinity, and I've been serving in the Evangelical Free Church for 23 years. And still enjoy it. I haven't loved every moment of it. Some of it's been super hard. In fact, I'll tell you about one of the hard times. Um, I was an associate pastor been pastoring for uh, eight, 
eight years, nine years in the same church with the same staff, and I was in conflict with the lead pastor. We were actually friends, not before, but we, we were work friends. It was good. But just with some ministry ideas and just things were not there, and the frustration over the years of trying to talk about it and work through it, the frustration grew deep and changed from frustration in my heart, changed to bitterness and judgment in my heart. And I could tell you all the things wrong with him. And, and I was stuck in that place and needed some help. And fortunately, at, uh, our church and found out actually that it was much broader than just the two of us, but a peacemaking team came to our church from St. Louis and walked us through a lot of the same principles we're going to talk about today. And so there was a teaching component. There was a coaching component where they came along us individually. So how, is he, how are you processing these things? What's happening in your heart? And then we had a mediation together. And I got to tell you, it was remarkable. It was my first exposure to this kind of material. And God healed every relationship in the room. And there were at least eight of us that were in bad shape. And I came through that thinking, I, I want to learn as much about this as I can. I don't want to be a pastor anymore if I don't understand how the gospel works like this. So that started me on my learning journey of learning about uh, going to Peacemaker Ministries at the time. There have been multiple ministries. In fact, I've got a few different logos on the slide there. Uh, one is... Um, is CRG, Crossroads Resolution Group. I work with them right now. I'm kind of bivocational. I pastor a church in Minneapolis, and I'm working with uh, Crossroads Resolution Group doing mediations um, really all over the country. And then the other are the two places I have certifications from, the ICC, Institute for Christian Conciliation and Relational Wisdom, which is Ken Sandy's organization. Um, Ken would get credit for developing a lot of these materials originally. And as different organizations grow and are birthed out of that, he's kind of the godfather. I was just with him last week. Uh, great guy, and, and um, it's really neat to see how God has used and blessed uh, his initial work to continue to help churches and believers all over the country. Uh, so that's who I am. Tell me a little bit about who you are. Um, and I might need to ask you a few questions for that, right? So let's see, how many of you are Rock Hill folk? Okay, and then some of you aren't. Where are you from? Renew Church. Renew Church Duluth. Renew Church Duluth. All right, welcome. Welcome. What roles do you guys have there? Yeah, yeah, good. Small group uh, leadership, yep. Board member. Board member, outstanding, yeah, great. Kids. Kids? <laughs> you don't look like kids. We're all, we're all kids, but you oversee kids and, and help with that. That's great. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, it really, really means a lot. Are there any counselors here? No counselors here. Okay. Okay. That's okay. Um, God will use each of you. As you learn this, I'm just giving you a heads up, by the way. As you learn this, uh, God might have you here to, so that you can help other people in conflict as well. In other words, um, you might be the person somebody comes to and says, I need help. And God can use you. So as you're here, you might have a couple of different kinds of listening ears on today. One might be, I just, I'm in ministry and I want to learn so that our church can, you know, be healthier. Great. That'll, ha that'll have a personal side to it. So you'll be sitting with a person who's in a conflict, and you'll be coaching them. And it's my goal that this will help equip you to coach them better. You'll have scripture, you'll have principles, you'll have materials that you can say, I think this might help. Okay, so that's one. On the other side, you might be here because you're in a conflict. Or, it would be kind of a silly question to ask, who's in a conflict right now? Because you're either in one, or you were recently, or you will be very soon. That's kind of the normalcy of life. 
And so I just want to acknowledge that. And for some of you, if you're, if you're feeling like the weight of conflict right now, then um, the best way to, to listen and learn over this seminar today is maybe to just kind of acknowledge that. And it's, instead of just fixating on it, saying, what, what piece can I learn that can fix this? Which is what we tend to do. Maybe just set that over here and say, how can I just learn whatever it is God wants me to learn today? That'll be a little better experience for you. You'll get a little more well-rounded, and then God will show you what to apply. But just kind of maybe set that aside so that the emotion of this doesn't, doesn't overwhelm what we're able to see. It can sometimes give us a tunnel vision, and then we miss some things. So that would be my encouragement for you um, as you, as you uh, listen today. So uh, a couple questions. Actually, there's, um, there are some mics, and I would only incur I would say this. Since we're recording, for the sake of anybody who might watch it later, we'll either have you use a mic or I'll try to kind of repeat and summarize what you say so that they don't have just long blank spots. But I would want to ask you this question. Why did you choose to come here today? What brought you here today? Amen to that, because I don't like conflict. Anybody resonate with that? Yeah, I actually really hate conflict. <laughs> I wouldn't choose this line of work. God chose it for me. Why are you here today? Okay, good. So when conflict comes, you want to be able to reflect Christ, uh, honor him, be good ambassador. Good. Ambassadors of reconciliation, God calls us to be. Yeah, that's right. All right, good. Well, I'm glad that you're here. Um, our format today will be roughly, we'll do about 45, 50 minutes, and then we'll take a, at least 10 minute break. Um, we're not going to go long. We won't go like hours. <laughs> so um, we'll do that. Uh, we want to respect the biology that's in the room and the need to, to, to get up and move around a little bit. Um, and bathrooms are downstairs. There's some coffee in the back. So if you feel like you need some coffee, I'll say this, go get it. Like, just go up and get it. Let's just be family here and enjoy our time together today. So another question I have for you. Where did you learn conflict resolution from? You've learned conflict resolution skills. Some of those skills are even good. Some of them aren't. Where did you learn from? Mom and dad, okay. And a lot of that was that like they're teaching you or they're just doing it and you're picking up. It's more caught than taught, yeah. Where else? From work. Okay, good, yep. Yeah, life experience. What was that last part? Failing, yes. Learned it from failing, amen to that. Marriage and marriage counseling, yeah. Yeah. I think, honestly, uh, marriage relationships is where this work is needed the most. It's the fastest growing phone call. I mean, nine out of our ten phone calls that come into Crossroads are, or uh, internet contacts are, uh, I need this help for, in my marriage right now. Yeah, for sure. So as you're picking up pieces, that's where you'll, that's, that's one of the areas where you'll be applying it, is helping people with marriage, but in, in other areas as well. Yeah, I had uh, a lot of places I learned it from as well. I worked in HR and human resources, my first job out of college. And what we did there was if you started, we was in the hospital, if you started to have a, a conflict with someone or someone was annoying to you or whatever, what we were taught is, is you just start documenting, document everything. In fact, when you fill the paper and you have multiple papers, you start a file and you build that file up until you've annoyed me so much, I have a whole big file against you, so now the first thing that happens is I can pull that file out and get you fired. Isn't that great? <laughs> what a fun place to work. And that's what would often happen. Instead of saying, hey, let's talk. 
let's work this through. We have some differences. Let's work it out. Uh, so I learned that uh, the documenting part is helpful, but not the way to resolve it. Um, and I've had a lot of other places. Raising four boys taught me a lot about conflict and a little bit about conflict resolution. <laughs> yeah. But how many of you have been through a personal conflict before? It should be pretty obvious. So I'm going to ask you um, a question about that. Where do you feel it? And this is a question about uh, your body. When you're in that situation, you're right in the midst of a conflict, right? And it's, and you can, sometimes we've been down that before and you can feel it coming even before it comes. Because parts of the brain that respond more quickly than our prefrontal cortex actually do start responding and our body can tell us we're in a conflict before the situation does. If we learn to listen to it. Put your hand where you feel conflict. Yeah, okay, good. So we're getting tightness in the chest, right? Right under the sternum, the most common place I'm seeing. I'm seeing some in the head, maybe headaches or just tension. Uh, I saw some shoulder blade right between the shoulder blades. I tend to carry stress there over long term. If I'm having cramping in the upper back, I know I need to look at other things in my life. Seeing some stomach issues. Yeah. We can really feel it. And by the way, all of the things that you guys just pointed at are all in an area of the body that's about this wide and about this long. It's the central nervous system is where you feel it from the brain uh, and then right down the vagal nerve system that runs in behind the lungs, which, uh, which is why often our chest feels it, our breathing is either impacted by that tension or we can often regulate our breathing to impact how, how our body is receiving that tension. We can, we can, it can go both ways. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but boy, we do feel, we feel that conflict, especially when it comes and we, we're stuck and we don't know how to get out of it. So this is one of my favorite uh, depictions of what conflict often feels like. Maybe you'll be able to relate to it. That's not good. Oh, I don't need this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! Hello? There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now. Would somebody please do something? Help! 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 <laughs> I don't believe this. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. <laughs> well, there's not enough left to do, is it? Hello? Hey, don't worry about it. I'll fix it in a second. <laughs> he said he can fix it. <laughs> All right. All right. That's more like it. He says he can fix it. It's about as good a depiction of church conflict as I've ever seen. <laughs> I like this guy. Somebody will come. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's so funny because, uh, man, we so often feel that way. And one of the ways we get stuck, we get stuck in a lot of ways. One of the ways we get stuck is when we're in a conflict, whether it's in our uh, marriage or family, 
setting. Thanksgiving's coming, so there'll be some new opportunities for conflict with family. Um, you may be already working on some of that. Or in a church or ministry setting, sometimes we look out and we, we fixate on an outcome. It needs to happen this way, or we need to get here, or this is what needs to happen. This is what's, I need it to go this way. And someone else has a different outcome in mind. And when we fixate on outcomes, that's one of the places we most frequently get stuck. We just don't make progress. We don't understand one another. We don't deal with issues of the heart when we're fixated on outcomes. I used to get super discouraged because I'd be like, oh my goodness, I'm, I get stuck in conflict. I'm a terrible pastor. I'm a failure, you know, and I would really get discouraged. And somebody once reminded me, who is the most conflicted person alive right now? In conflict with more people than anyone else. You would think so. That's pretty high on the list. Yep. Yeah, my mind went right to politicians and some of this stuff. Um, if I just tweak the language a little bit, who is conflicted with more human beings than anyone else in all of creation? God is. And He's okay, He is good. He's done nothing wrong, and he is in conflict with more people than anyone else on this planet. In fact, he was in conflict with me and with you, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And he's still in conflict with some of us sometimes, because we get fixated on outcomes that might not be his will. And yet it reminds me, conflict itself isn't isn't the problem, it's evidence of, of other problems. It's evidence that there's some, some misalignment in the heart. Conflict itself is an opportunity. We'll talk about that in a moment. But, um, but what I want to show is that God's Word speaks to our conflict. God's Word has a lot to say. In fact, that's one of the things that surprised me the most when I went through a church reconciliation process, is I did not realize how much God's Word had to say about conflict resolution. Uh, there was a lot more there than I thought. This is a repeatable process that God's Word teaches us. Um, and, and Ken Sandy kind of helped organize this around his, the, the book, The Peacemaker, is organized around these areas, these headings. So if you ever read that book, I'd highly recommend it. Um, but the first thing we do uh, when conflict comes is we commit to glorify God. It's so easy to say, this is the thing that's most important. Uh, this is the idea I'm going to fight for, the position that I hold, and instead... Uh, open our hands and commit to glorifying God. Um, there are four verses on there. I'm going to have uh, you guys read them. So if you have a Bible, uh, look up, just pick one of those and start looking it up. And if anybody has 1 Corinthians 10.31 or maybe has it memorized, shout it out. Yeah, no matter what you do, give all glory to God. Um, glorify God in all things. So that's true in conflict as well. In fact, when you choose to stop and give glory to God in the middle of a conflict, I think that's, that's something that really glorifies God. It's easy when we see the beautiful sunrise or sunset. It's, oh, wow, look what you did, Lord. That's so cool. When you're in a conflict and everything feels dark, commit to God's glory. The second one is getting the log out of your own eye. Um, Matthew chapter 7. If nobody has that one looked up, that's okay. We're going to go there in a little bit. Um, but Jesus says, when I'm, when I'm seeing a speck in my brother's eye, I should actually stop and realize I have a log in my own eye. I need to remove the log in my own eye before I start trying to help my brother with the speck that I see in his eye. Galatians 6.1. I like the, that word in there, restore him gently. <laughs> we gently restore one another. 
And that's part of how we help each other grow. And then finally, go and be reconciled, Ephesians 4.32. And this is a process. We don't just do this one time. This is something we do all the time as we navigate conflicts, disagreements, and differences throughout life. Uh, a word picture that really helps me understand is, is uh, the forest. Did you guys get a lot of smoke this summer from the Canadian wildfires? You sure did. We got it down where I am too. I'm sure you got more. Um, all this material, and all it takes is a spark. When that spark comes, there's so much fuel to burn that it just creates this massive forest fire, and it'll burn so hot, it'll kill a lot of the trees. It'll often leave nothing alive on the other side, and except whatever might be under the ground. It'll literally devastate the entire forest, and you can smell it all the way down here. Um, and sometimes church conflicts, family conflicts, can be like that. They can grow out of control, and all the old things, all the old offenses, all the old wrongs that have never been processed are added into that original one, right? This is where oftentimes in, mar when it, in marriage, we don't know how to, like, work through our stuff. Then one little thing happens, and now we've escalated this. We're having this argument. And I have to be honest, I've had arguments with my wife where I've paused and thought, I have no idea what we're arguing about. <laughs> I don't remember what started it. I don't, what was the thing? Was it about the coffee pot or the vacation or what? I don't even know because it quickly became about all the other unresolved stuff that was laying there adding fuel to this fire. <laughs> Now we're burning down, burning down the house. It's crazy. But um, when I went to South Dakota a number of years ago, I saw these things. Do you know what these are? Uh, they're fires, but they're not forest fires. Those are... S exactly, yeah. Good. Targeted burns, right? So we've, they've collected over, over undergrowth. They've gone in and pulled stuff out. <clears throat> and then they built, they build like big, big flat piles. And, and we're not afraid of conflict, but we're able to address things using those four principles. We can repeat that process. We get to, to clear out the stuff. We get to kind of burn off our differences and our conflicts with one another. We get to learn how to address things and talk about our differences and, and process conflicts that are about this, not about everything else. When we can talk about this and talk through this, come to some understanding and move forward. Now, this has been dealt with. It doesn't need to come up and contribute to the next thing. And so God gives us help. He gives us this repeatable process so that we can, we can work through it. Um, and again, I think I alluded to this. Every conflict provides three opportunities. When a conflict comes up, we have an opportunity to glorify God we have the opportunity to become more like Jesus. Did Jesus go through any conflicts? Can you think of some? What conflicts did Jesus face? There were a few. Just think of some or some people he was in conflict with. Pharisees. Pharisees. <laughs> All the time. Yep. Harsh conflicts. Whew. Yeah, so what were you arguing about back there? Yeah. Right in the disciples, right in the team. Yep. Yep. They're arguing about who's the greatest. They're arguing about all kinds of really stupid things. And Jesus would point that out sometimes. Jesus is a teaching moment. What else? What other conflicts did Jesus have? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's flipping table. He, so he's like the one, you, you might look at that and say he's causing the conflict. He's initiating the conflict. That conflict was already there between God and man. He's just coming in and saying, let me present God's view <laughs> on this. Good. Any other conflicts? Yeah, with Satan, personally, directly. Yeah, Absolutely. 
Yeah, it's a big one. What other conflicts did Jesus have? Yeah, yeah. This is like the ultimate God-sin conflict where he's literally taking on the sin of the world. Family conflict, yep. Yep. His family's trying to rescue him from his delusions of grandeur. Absolutely. Yep, that's a little hard to understand sometimes theologically, but Jesus, in his humanity, had a conflict with his father. And we see him wrestle through that conflict, and in the end, submit, not my will, but your will. So there was two different desires or wills in play, causing conflict. Absolutely. You could also say, I think, he had conflict with within himself, because part, part of it shows up there as well. Like, I don't want to do this. This is something I don't want to do. I'm resisting doing a thing that I'm also choosing to do, and there was internal conflict as well. So when we are in conflict, we really can say, Jesus has showed us a lot of example to follow. I'm in pretty good company. And when someone's mad at me, I don't have to be crushed and lose my, like, my identity is destroyed because someone's upset with me. I can actually say, how do I, people were mad at Jesus. What did he do? How do I follow him? And he taught us a lot about, I mean, overtly taught us how to walk through conflict. How do I obey the teaching of Jesus and follow the example of Jesus as I go through this stuff? Uh, and then the third opportunity is the opportunity to love and serve one another. Um, you can love your brother or sister in Christ. You can serve your brother and sister in Christ. But when you're in conflict with them and you take the opportunity to put their interests above your own, now you're talking. Now the gospel is in play. It's easy for us to do the gospel in the areas that I want, where I find fulfillment that feel good to me. That's fine. That's okay. But God is calling us to set my... To, what, what is the call? Uh, take up your cross and follow me. Or as Paul said, I die daily. It's not about me getting what I want. It's about me serving uh, a brother or sister in Christ. And we have all those opportunities. Work, working on this um, is good for us it's also good. Uh, it impacts our, our church as well. Um, there's a few scriptures on the board here. Can I get some volunteers to look up these, these scripture passages? When we respond well in the midst of conflict. 1 John 4, verse 20. I'm going to make you work today. Okay, whoever claims to love God hates a brother or sister is a liar. Yeah. So this idea to say, hey, we're going to come together for worship. While we're in unresolved bitterness toward each other, if we're responding poorly to conflict, our worship just became kind of a joke. But how often have you faked it? <laughs> I have come to church, and I think I'm really trying to worship God and put him first, but I haven't dealt with this, this conflict with a brother or sister in Christ. And God is telling us, no, these two, they're connected. You can't just, you can't put one in a box and then be okay. We've got to be whole people. Uh, Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Yes. Uh, if you're then, if you're often... Good. You're going to give your gift at the altar. You realize that one isn't even, I realize I have a problem with my brother. That goes a step further. I realize my brother has a problem against me. Set my gift to the side. Go work on that relationship. How many of you have ever paused? And you, you don't have to answer this, but let's just be honest here. How many of you have ever paused your giving or tithing or whatever you call it to church because you're working through a personal conflict? My hand's up because I have. Okay. It's a, it's a biblical principle um, I don't think he's saying, if you go to give your gift at the altar and have unresolved conflict, just, just, you just keep that money. <laughs> you don't have to give this time. Like, I like conflict. This is great. I end up with more money. He's saying, leave it beside the altar 
Um, I've actually taken like a manila envelope and I take my tithe and I put it in there. And so I'm still tithing. I'm just not offering it as an act of worship yet to God. I'm going to work on this relationship until I can either say, praise the Lord, he helped us reconcile and give all of the gifts at once. Or I can say, I feel like I've done as far as I possibly can. And I can release this unresolved thing into God's hands and give the gift. So I'm still giving it to the Lord. Um, but but our, our conflict impacts our worship. It also impacts our witness. Uh, the next verse on there, John 13. Yeah, that's right. They'll know you by the love that you have for one another. Um, how do people feel about churches these days? Who loves it? <laughs> there's, there's people in the world who are struggling with a lot of church hurt. Uh, you look online, people are talking about it. You, you run into people at work. And I remember I was doing middle school ministry later. Uh, every time our, the church, my, the first church I was in, every time they'd fire a youth pastor, I got middle school until they hired anyone, which happened all the time. Um, not advising that you fire a youth pastor. Um, you need, but so I was overseeing middle school and I remember being in town. I went out to eat with another staff member and we were walking by the mall and there were like three middle school girls walking in front of us and I, we could overhear their conversation and one said, Hey, you want to come to church with me? And the other middle school girl school, the other middle school girl said, why would I do that? I don't want to get raped. Two pastors walking right behind him like, what did she say? Did I hear that right? And I thought about it for a minute, and I thought, at that time, what was in all the news was the, the Catholic clergy sex abuse scandals, one after another after another, literally hundreds of cases being tried in every state in the U.S. I don't know how much you understand about that. Hundreds of actual verified cases in every state were all happening at that time. And I thought, she's, she's not wrong. What happens in church has a massive impact on our, on our, uh, our testimony, on our witness. And people out there who need Jesus can't see Jesus, they're looking at Christians going, are they different or are they not different? And in some cases, they're thinking, they're worse than we are. And when churches have unresolved conflict with bitterness and uh, aggressive posturing and all this stuff, and which you sometimes we see more and more online, the world's disgusted by it. Why in the world would they give their life to Jesus? That sounds awful. But they'll know that we're Christians by our love. We have an opportunity to be different. Sadly, not just like saved and different from the world, we have the opportunity to be different than most churches. And that's, that's why I'm here. That's why this is important to me. It's one of the reasons why. Um, there's a lot of reasons why, but one of the reasons why is because I think God's word calls us to be different, calls us to make an impact on the world. Um, God's Word addresses a lot on conflict resolution. There's several verses listed here. I'll just mention a few of them, uh, and then we'll take a break in just a moment. Um, Matthew 5, 9. Do you know that verse? It's in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Yep. Um, that is, this is a calling for us. It's an opportunity. It's a blessing that we have helping people in conflict. James three nineteen talks about how um, the, the uh, fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. When we're making peace, when we're peacemakers, we're sowing seeds that reap a harvest of righteousness. In a, in a church setting, when conflict comes in the church, one of the, some of the first things to go is our witness, like we just talked about. Uh, also, our love for one another our care for the flock. I've seen elder boards in conflict with each other 
and they, for six months, have not prayed for anybody in the church or done one thing to help another person. They're just fixated on this. But when we sow peace, it reaps a harvest of righteousness. James 5, 16 talks about the healing that comes after we've applied biblical principles. The healing that comes in the church. 1 Corinthians 10, 1. Paul's calling for them to agree with one another that there be no divisions, which is funny because he's 1 Corinthians 10, 1. If you've read 1 Corinthians, you know there were divisions in that church. In fact, there were at least 13 unresolved issues that Paul addresses in that one letter. It is a big-time conflict, conflicted church, perhaps the most conflicted church in the New Testament. Uh, and he's, uh, he's calling people to resolve them. Um, and if you find yourself in the middle of it, it's, listen to this verse in 1 Corinthians, same book, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which is the chapter that we refer to when we lead communion, right? So we're going to come together, uh, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you that the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took the bread. And, you know, that passage is in there. And right next to it, right before it, Paul says, right before this, we don't usually talk about this when we do communion, in the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. Paul's like, part of the reason we do communion is to surface our, our unresolved conflicts, our differences, so that we get to see how we act in them. And it reveals if you're, if you're walking by the Spirit or walking according to the flesh. Are you fighting to be right and fighting to dominate over your brother or sister in Christ? Or are you showing the fruit of the Spirit in, in the midst of a conflict? That's part of the reason we do communion. So that we can realize God is refining me and growing me and calling me to walk according to the Spirit. Um, name a book in the Bible. The book of Acts. Was there conflict in the book of Acts? <laughs> sure. Acts chapter 6, the, the, uh, the Greek widows were saying, hey, those, those Jewish widows are getting more stuff than we are. We're hungry, and they're getting all the food, and we're upset, and there was a conflict. That's why deacons were established, to help resolve that conflict and keep it, keep it fair. Good. Name another book in the, New, in the, in the Bible. Judges. Book of Judges. Are there any conflicts in Judges? Yeah. It is a book of, of conflicts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have the people in conflict with God in this cycle of like falling away, worshiping false gods. God brings some kind of horrible thing, usually an enemy, raises up a judge to fight. Some of the judges were kind of jerks, actually, like Samson. In Genesis, any conflicts in Genesis? <laughs> Adam and Eve in the garden. Oh, uh, the, Cain and Abel. Yeah, Cain is like, uh, Abel's offering was accepted. Cain, what, happened, what did he do? What did he feel? What emotion did he feel? Do you remember? Cain, Cain's emotion that God came and pointed out to him. There was jealousy and there was anger. And God came and said, why are you so angry? Sin is crouching at your door. It longs to have you, but you must master it. Right? You, need to, you need to rule over, over that. Um, and he was like, I'm not going to. I'm going to give in to it. So he went out and killed his brother. I mean, we could literally do this all day. I, I think every single book of the Bible either demonstrates conflict's impact on believers or gives us instruction of how to walk through conflict as God followers. Every book in the Bible. This book has way more to, to say about this than I ever thought it did. I went through seminary, I was pastoring, and I had no idea. So it's when I started looking with different eyes at it, oh, there's more. Oh, there's more. Wow, look at that. There's more to learn about that. 
There is so much help here for us, and it's a wonderful thing. Um, and so God's calling us to learn new things and put them into practice. Um, put them into practice is the key. So as we come through today, find some things to put into practice. Um, if, you've, if you have any sports coaches in here, um, some of us have coached sports. How many sports coaches are here? What, co- what sport? Football. Football. Football, right? Baseball, cross country, I coach runners at the high school. Um, we, we teach our athlete to do a new thing. They have to learn it, a new skill or a new way, and then we practice. We have practice so they can practice doing the new thing over and over and over again. And that's what we need to do in our conflict as believers, is learn the new thing that God's Word says, and we have to practice. We have to do the new thing over and over again until that becomes normal for us. And then all of a sudden, we're responding completely differently than we would without it. Um, We're going to take a a break. Whoops, sorry, Kyle. There you go. Actually get the break slide on there, um, and I won't take it back this time. So we're going to take about 10 minutes. It's coffee, there's some snacks, uh, restrooms in the basement, and we'll get started in about 10 minutes again.